Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. Last, over the last few weeks, we've been working our, our way through a series on the seven churches, the messages to the seven churches of Asia. Now, these were real live churches. When we talk about Asia, we're not talking about like China or Japan. We're talking about the Roman province of Asia. That would really be the area of Turkey today. All seven of these churches were located within the boundaries of what would today be the country of Turkey. And what we're doing is looking at these messages that Jesus delivered to these seven churches because in many ways, these seven churches have problems that are common to every church. In fact, throughout the 175-year history of First Baptist Church Metropolis, there have been times when we have resembled any one of these churches. There are times in our own spiritual lives where if we really take an honest look, we would say, well, you know, sometimes I'm kind of like the church in Ephesus. I'm going through all of the right actions. I'm doing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm dedicated to, to, to all the, the, the doctrine and those kind of things, but sometimes our love for Jesus, our first love sort of begins to wane. And we're like the church in Ephesus. At other times, uh, we find that we're churches that, uh, you know, get involved in compromise and other issues. Tonight, uh, we're going to look at the church at Thyatira. And I want you to join me in, in Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 down through verse 29. This is the longest of all of the seven letters. And it begins in verse number 18, where Jesus says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love, and your faith, and servants, and, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, uh, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works." But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, do not lay, uh, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule over them with a rod iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. Even as I myself have received authority from my Father, I will gi- and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." Now, let's take just a moment and kind of understand where the church of Thyatira is and a little bit about this particular city. you remember that John is writing to these letters basically in the order that they would appear if you were following the common trade route. So he's writing from the island of Patmos. He's held there as an exile and being held as a prisoner on this small island of Patmos. If he was to leave there by ship and go due east, he would run into the city of Ephesus. From there, this trade route just sort of kind of works its way up and around through Turkey. And you can kind of see this map isn't very large, but you get to Ephesus, and then if you turn north, you go to Smyrna and then Pergamum. Thyatira is kind of located just to the southeast of, of the city of Pergamon. It was strategic not so much because of how the city was situated. In fact, it's situated on a, on a low-lying plain. It's the last place you'd want to build a defensive city. Uh, normally, if you want to build a, a defensive city in that day, you want to build it up high on a mountain, somewhere where it's going to be hard to get to and hard to march to. Pergamum or Thyatira didn't enjoy that position, but it is the first line of defense 
for the city of Pergamum. And that's important. You'll remember I told you last week that Pergamum was well known in that day for holding a large treasury. That's where Alexander the Great deposited a lot of gold. The Romans used it that same way. So even though it's not located on the best of places to defend, Pergam or Thyatira is the first line of defense against uh, for Pergamum. It is a strategic city. It is an important city for that uh, matter. In, in its day, it was known basically for two things. Number one, it was a place where they made a lot of dyed cloth. In fact, we know that from the book of Acts. Over in bo the book of Acts, chapter 16, Paul, the apostle Paul meets a woman named Lydia, and, and she is converted. She was a businesswoman from Thyatira, and the Bible tells us that she was there making purple cloth. Thyatira made a off-brand cheap version of purple cloth that the Romans just absolutely went wild over. They loved it, all right? And that's a place where it was made, in the city of Thyatira. It was also known for its metalwork. In fact, uh, if you'll notice there in, in verse number 18, the scripture says, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira write the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. The Greek word there that's translated burnished bronze is actually a word that was a trade name. Uh, the the uh, uh, Thyatirans had made a particular kind of metal where they would, uh, it was an alloy where they would combine an uh, uh, um, amount of copper and an amount of zinc and make a very specific type of bronze out of it. And, and that's the very word for it. It, it's a, it was like a trade name in those days. In fact, both of those images of Jesus there, uh, of a flame uh, uh, where his eyes are a flaming fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. Both of those images come right out of metalwork. And, and so right away, he's personalizing this letter to Thyatira. And he begins to comment on some of the things that he commends the church for. He commends the church of Thyatira for four things. Notice in verse 19, he said, I know your works I love that phrase that Jesus repeats all through these letters over and over and over again. He says to the churches, I know what you're doing. I know. That's so important for us to keep in mind as believers. Whatever we're going through, whatever we're doing in this life, Jesus knows. He's aware. He is all-seeing, all-knowing. He always knows what's going on in our lives and in our hearts. There is nothing that is hidden from his sight. Now, for, for many of us, that is a wonderful word of comfort, is it not? Uh, if you're going through a difficult and trying time, which many of these churches were, it was a comfort to know that Jesus knows where you're at. Have you ever gone through a moment in your life where you say to yourself, no one understands, no one knows, no one sees what I'm going through. There'll be moments in your life when you encounter that. There are moments in the church sometimes where we wonder, has God abandoned us? Next week, we're going to talk uh, in our services about the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation. I am quite certain, in fact, I know for sure that there were moments in, in Martin Luther's life and Jan Hus's life and, and, and all all of the other reformers, Wycliffe's life and Tyndale's life and all of these other great men who stood and, 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 and helped to make sure that we have a Bible in our hands and the gospel in our hands, there were moments when they felt like they were abandoned. So Jesus reminds the church, I know what's going on. By the way, that should strike terror in our hearts when we're in sin, amen? Amen. Not only does Jesus know where we're at and what's going on in our life when we're encountering trouble, but when we're in rebellion, Jesus also knows. You know, there's, a, there's one thing that the Bible makes very clear. We cannot get away with sin. It will always find us out. Yeah, my dad used to tell me that. Listen, you're going to go do stuff in your life and you're going to think you get away with it. I want you to know I'll find out. He always did. <laughs> I couldn't get away with anything. He seemed to be all-knowing, all-seeing. Now, 
my dad really wasn't all-knowing and all-seeing. He just seemed that way. But I guarantee you, Jesus is. He knows all and he sees all. And so he reminds the church, I know what your works. Notice what he says. He commends them for four different works. He says, I know your love. I know um, uh, your, your faith. Uh, I, and and, and uh, I know your works, your love, your faith, your service, and patient endurance. Uh, he mentions four different things here. He says, first of all, I know your faith. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says this, And without faith is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. There, there's, there's two ways that interpreters have understood that word faith there. And both of them are potential ways to understand the passage and both of them are important one way is to look at this as he knows their personal faith in the lord jesus christ in other words he he's talking there about their trust in the gospel their trust in the work of jesus christ and he says i know your faith and maybe even that he has the idea there their continued faithfulness they are continuing to remain true to the gospel they're continuing to remain true to those things that they have started out with the bible makes it very clear without faith it's impossible to please god that's the the very foundation of our walk with jesus is trusting him every moment every day in every aspect of our life but another way to look at that is that he's talking about the faith He's talking there about the doctrinal content of our, uh, our trust and in, in, in belief in Jesus. Sometimes we take the, the word faith and we apply that to talk about the faith. In other words, all of the things that we believe about God. And he's reminding them there, I noticed and I know what you believe. I know that you have started out going the right direction. The second thing he says, and he commends them, and these two virtues go together all through the new testament he said i commend you for your faith but i also commend you for your love um, the bible makes it very clear that those who trust in christ one of the things that's going to happen in their life is they're going to love jesus and they're going to love other people um, it's impossible to come to know with jesus without also then starting to have a compassion and a love for other believers uh, over in first corinthians chapter 13 the apostle paul writes about this in a passage that we commonly read in weddings but it's a passage that has nothing whatsoever to do with the love between a husband and a wife, nor has it anything to do with a wedding. Actually, Jesus is talking in 1 Corinthians 13 about how we are to conduct our lives and ourselves in the ministry of the church he's been talking there about spiritual gifts and he's writing to a church that is incredibly gifted all of the spiritual gifts there are present in the church in corinth and paul is reminding them that in our ministry in the things we do for jesus it must be done in a way that can be described as loving, in a way that is conducive to the love of Jesus and that is reflective of the love of Jesus. Listen to what he says. He said, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have a prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And he goes on and on. And what's Paul's reminding them of? You can be as gifted and as talented as you can possibly be. But if you don't love other people, ultimately all of that comes to naught. It really doesn't matter. Have you ever met somebody who knows everything but doesn't love anybody? You know, they're very intelligent. He's talking there about people who are enormously talented in the church in Corinth. The two preeminent gifts that everybody wanted was tongues and prophecy. That's the ones that everybody really noticed and everybody paid to. He says, you can stand up and speak in tongues all day, but if you don't love your brothers and sisters, you're just making a lot of noise. That's what he means. 
He says, if you stand up and you preach and you can open up the scripture and you can explain it to everybody, but if you don't love, then you comes to naught. He even mentions there, did you notice faith? He says, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains. Faith is the foundation of our Christian walk, but it does not stop there. He says, if I have the faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, ultimately, what does he say? He says, I am nothing. And so he reminds them, and over here in the book of Revelation, he commends this church of Thyatira. He says, I know your faith. I know your love. He says, I know your service. The word there in the original is diakonos. It's the word from which we get deacon. The word deacon just simply means servant. And all the way through the New Testament, Jesus is described, by the way, uh, with that term. Jesus is a servant. Uh, There are servants in the church. And the role here, as he's reminding them of, is that as believers, we exist. and, And part of our purpose in life is to serve Jesus and other people. I, I want to commend our church here for just a moment. I, I am simply amazed sometimes when I stand back, and, I, and I've been this way for 10 years now. Standing back and watching this church do big projects. This week, the Judgment House is one of the biggest things we do during the course of the year. It, just, it takes a lot of people, probably 150 or more people are involved in it. It's long hours. It's, you know, it, it started, uh, what, on Tuesday night, and, and, and people have been here every night, Tuesday night, Wednesday, Thursday. It finishes up tonight. we got to tear everything down and turn the building back into a church building by tomorrow morning. Uh, it, it's a lot of work. And here's what's amazing to, to me about this. People come out and serve and minister and do all of this all week without complaining, without arguing. You know what's amazing? I haven't had one person in my office complaining about anyone else all week, and you've all been here all week. That's amazing. Most of the time, if you put four people together, two of them are going to get in a fight within an hour, all right? But something happens. Here, there's probably a couple reasons for that. One is maybe it's just good disposition of people, but I rather suspect it's uh, an evidence of the Holy Spirit working in in our midst. Amen? The Holy Spirit just kind of, I want to say this, the Holy Spirit sometimes is kind of the grease that keeps us from rubbing up against each other and causing friction. Y'all, y'all understand what I mean? We, we talk about our staff. We work together wonderfully. We don't, but I think one of the reasons we work together wonderfully is the Holy Spirit kind of greases us every once in a while. You know what I mean? We're different from each other. I have a different personality than Cliff. Cliff has a different personality than John. John has a different personality from everybody else on the face of the earth. I'm just teasing. Clarissa has a different personality. Clarissa was the only sane one on, the, on this whole staff. All right? She's the one that kind of keeps the rest of us in check. But here's what happens. There will be moments, and I I don't want to say this in a bad way. I want you to understand this is actually a positive thing. There will be moments where Cliff and I disagree. Over the last 10 years, have we disagreed a time or two? Once or twice. Here's what's beautiful about this. is somehow the Holy Spirit greases that and keeps two guys that every once in a while rub up against each other, and, and create a little friction. The Holy Spirit just greases that. What happens? He's talking here about the fact that they're serving together, and they're ministering, and they're doing the job. Here's what's beautiful about this relationship, and I think this was happening in Thyra Tyra. Everybody there knew they had a role. I know Cliff has a role. He knows I have a role. We play different roles. John has a role. Clarissa has a role. In our church uh, ministry, everybody has different roles. We have, on our deacons, we have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful group of deacons, but each deacon has a different role. They have different ministries they perform, different tasks they perform within the wider body of the church. Everyone has a job to do. And here's what's beautiful. When everybody's doing their job, things hum And things move, and ministry gets done. And here's what's amazing. People's lives get changed. Amen? And he's talking there. He said, I want to commend you. You are serving Jesus actively. I'll say this about this church. 
Um, this church is active. Uh, this church, I was talking to Dennis Connor here a little while back. I was riding around Chicago during the Chicago week. Um, Dennis put me in his car and we just drove around and we went from place to place. You know, we'd go over and spend a little time with Caleb and his crew up in uh, Pingree Grove. And, and then we'd drive over to the, uh, uh, the north side of town, kind of the downtown area there, uptown they call it. And we'd run into Carl there for a little while and we'd hang out with his group for a little bit. And then we went over and hung out with the kids that were on the beach. Cliff had that group over there and, and there were some others that were there. And, and we just go from section to section. And he began to talk. He says, you know what? He says, Pastor... I'm amazed by all of the things that First Baptist Church does in the area of missions. That's true. I, I don't, I honestly, I don't understand how that happens. Other than we have a lot of folks who believe in the Great Commission and who God uses. Now, I, I'm not, by the way, bragging on you. I'm bragging on Jesus when I say that. Because if it wasn't for him doing all of that through us, none of that would be impossible. So he commends the church here for their service and their work. But then he also commends them for their patient endurance. Now that's an important word there because patient endurance refers to the fact that they are going through hardships. They're going through difficult times. The word patience that's translated there as patience really doesn't mean putting up with difficult people. It means putting up with very trying and very difficult circumstances. You and I know this. If you're going to follow Jesus any length of time, are you going to have some hardships? Yes. Are you going to have some moments that are difficult? Yes. Are you going to have some obstacles in the middle of your Yes. And he reminds them, he commends them through all of that. And I don't know what all that was. You know, I, in, a church, in a place like Thyatira, that could have been any range of things, ranging from persecution, which was pretty likely in a place like that. There was a large, large military uh, presence in the city of Thyatira. It was also a very pagan city. And so the church there probably had a very, very challenging time, very much so like we do here in America at times. It can, and by the way, probably will get more difficult as we go along. And he's reminding them of their patient endurance. He says, I commend you for that. He says one final thing that really summarizes all four of those virtues. Notice what he says. He says, I know your works, your love, your faith, your service, and patient endurance. And look what he says. And that your latter works exceed the first. He says, you're growing in all of this. You're growing in all this. You're, you're moving forward. But then in the next verse, verse 20, he says, but, but I have this one thing against you. And this was a serious, serious issue that could undermine all of the good things that they were doing. And we need to pay, pay very close attention to this. He says, you are tolerating, he says it in verse number 20, but I have this against you that you tolerate that woman Jezebel. Now we're talking about who that is in just a couple of moments, but let me tell you about that word tolerate. Tolerate basically means that you just stand back and you let someone do something with no resistance. Now there are moments in our life where tolerance is a virtue. We all have to deal sometimes with annoying and difficult people, right? We all have to deal with a person that doesn't do things the way we think they ought to do it. We have a neighbor that doesn't maybe, you know, clean up their yard the way you think they should or take care of their house the way you think they should. You have a coworker that doesn't do their job. And sometimes it is a virtue to step back and just tolerate that, right? Because it's, it's just minor things that you just need to learn to show patience towards. Other times, tolerance can be wrong. Here in this particular situation, they have someone in the church that he labels Jezebel. We're, almost every Bible scholar is, is certain on this fact. This was not this lady's real name. No Jew or person that understood anything about the Old Testament in that day would have named their daughter Jezebel. Jezebel became, in fact, even Gentiles didn't like the name Jezebel. And the reason was, was because way back in Israel's history, there was a king named Ahab who had married a pagan wife named Jezebel and who had introduced 
all kinds of immorality and idolatry into the life of the nation of Israel. So when he calls her Jezebel, he's, he's using that word we would today. If we say, man, she's a Jezebel, usually we mean she's fooling around. She's a hussy. All right? We got other words for that, but you can, you can flood them in. All right? She's, she's a woman who has a bad reputation. He says, this Jezebel... He says, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching. He's making something very clear there. She's standing before, a a prophetess, by the way, does not mean she was foretelling the future. A prophet in the Bible primarily is charged with the task of announcing what God's will is in the present. And so a prophetic uh, message is saying, here's what God is saying to the church right now. She's getting up in front of the church claiming to have a message from God, and she's teaching. She has this prophetic role, and she's standing up, and she's teaching. And he doesn't really get into a lot of detail about her teaching, but he connects it. He says, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idolatry, uh, idols. We don't really know for sure what all she was doing, but it involves some level of sexual promiscuity. Maybe she was lowering the standards of morality in the church. Maybe she was just presenting herself in a way that would have been improper. We don't know for sure. And she was seducing the church to uh, uh, leave and, and to get involved in idols. And this is going on apparently openly in the church. And so you notice what Jesus says about it. He says, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent. That's an interesting statement right there. Jesus says, listen, it's not that I haven't dealt with this woman. It isn't that that I'm just now taking notice. I've given her an opportunity to repent. Can can I say to you honestly, here's, here's when the time of repentance is. The time of repentance is from the time that you begin to sin and are aware of it and the time that God's judgment comes down upon you. Anywhere in that gap is a time for repentance. The very fact that God does not immediately judge us for every sin we commit is a sign of his grace and his mercy. It is an indication to us that he is offering us grace. He's giving us that moment to repent. When you and I sin, he gives us a time to repent, does he not? He didn't come down and just start, you know, disciplining us the very first moment. First of all, we get that conviction in our hearts. We know that what we're doing is wrong. He's given her an opportunity to repent, and she has not taken it. So notice what he says. He said, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual morality. Behold, I'll throw her onto a sickbed. In other words, he's going to judge her now. He's going to chastise her. I'm going to throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw in the great tribulation, unless they repent of her works. He said, those that have fallen prey to this bad teaching and to this woman's influence, I'm going to judge them as well, unless they repent. Notice there again, there's a window. This is a warning. Jesus is saying, listen, if you've fallen into this, repent, turn around. There's still time. You can fix this, but you need to hurry. You need to get it right. You need to repent. He says, and I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Jesus is being very blunt here. Now, how we should take that, whether that's literal or figurative, is up for debate within. I believe that he's saying there literally that this is a woman who has gone so far in her rejection of the things of God that Jesus is saying to her, you are past that moment of repentance. I've given you every opportunity. You have not. So I will take your life now. You know, the Bible says there's a sin that leads to death. There is. We can sin so long and so hard and so frequently and so callously and reject the the grace of God for so long that finally God will just say to us, I'd rather you not even be there and take us home. 
And he's saying to the church, these people are right there at that edge. And so he's urging them and he's encouraging them, turn back, repent. Uh, There are three key lessons there that I think we can learn about this woman, Jezebel. First of all, this passage reminds us that good works cannot make up for bad doctrine. These are people who are thinking, because we're doing a lot of good things, we're an active church. Look how active we are. We're we're doing all kinds of good things in the name of Jesus. And yeah, sure, we've got this one crazy teacher, and she's standing up, and she's leading some people astray. But we're doing lots and lots of good things. They thought that, that doing things could make up for bad doctrine. That's not true. The reality is that you have, there's two sides of this equation. There's right doctrine, orthodoxy, right doctrine, and there is right practice, orthopraxy. Two things that make up the Christian life. We must believe and know the right things. We must know the truth. But then we also must put those things into practice. And if you don't have one, listen, if you have orthodoxy, If you have all of the right doctrine and all the right beliefs, but don't put them in the practice, that's dead orthodoxy. You know all the doctrine. I know a lot of believers like that. If you want to meet a lot of people that fall into that category, I'm going to be careful how I say it, go to the seminary. You meet lots of people who know all the right doctrines and all the right beliefs and who can tell you everything you ever wanted to know about the Bible, but sometimes don't put it into practice. Now, I'm not saying that about all, you know, professors. I'm not saying that. But many have lost their passion for Jesus. That's dead orthodoxy. Others have fallen into the mistake of liberalism. They say, well, as long as I'm doing the right things, it doesn't matter what I believe. And will tolerate anything. You have to have both sides of that equation in order to make it balance. We must know and believe the right things, and we must put those things into practice. Second th- lesson we learn: God knows and sees all. I've already talked a great deal about that. He says, "I am He who searches the mind and heart." God really knows what's in your heart. He knows what is true, even when we do our best to hide it, even when. We don't even really know what's in our heart. Have you ever been there? When you look at your heart, you really don't recognize how wicked and how evil your heart really is. God still knows. He knows and he sees all. That's why in the Psalms we're taught to ask God to search our hearts, to show us what's really in there, to show us what we're really like. And by the way, when you do that, he will. He'll begin to reveal to you what's your life. God knows and sees all. We can't hide anything from him. And God will deal with the false teaching in the church. We may tolerate tolerate it for a time, but God will not. One of the things I love about what we're going to do next week is we're going to talk about the Reformation and you say, oh, you're going to talk about history. No, we're going to talk about how God works How God worked then, and it'll clue us into how he's working now. And here's one of the beautiful things about what happened in the Reformation. They came back, and they they reclaimed the biblical doctrine. It all really started with a guy reading the Bible. What a novel idea. But somebody actually picked up the Bible and started reading it and saying, what it says here isn't quite what we're teaching in the church. And he began to teach something different. And what happened was it set all of Europe ablaze with the gospel. But here's one of the beautiful things about the Reformation. It wasn't just theology. It wasn't just guys sitting down working out doctrinal stimulus. Oh, yes, it started there. But here's what the beauty of it was. It changed the entire fabric of the church. John's going to tell you about how it changed worship. What we do in worship this very day was affected by what happened back then. How they went out and began to minister to people and and take the church outside the four walls of a building and minister to a community. It happened because they got into the Word. That's what he's telling the church of Thyatira. You must put these things into practice. You must get this teaching straightened out so that the gospel can go forth. Then he makes a promise. 
very quickly, notice what he says. Verse 24, but to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, do, uh, to, to you I, I say, I do not lay, hold, lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. He tells them, hold fast. Keep doing the things that I've told you to do. Hold fast to these doctrines and to these practices. And then what he says, the one who conquers... To every single church that he writes to in the book of Revelation, he's going to say those same words. Back in the book, uh, in chapter 2, he talked to the church in Ephesus in verse 17, and listen to what he, or in verse 7, um, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat the tree of life. Then over again uh, uh, in verse number 11, to the one who conquers, to the church in Smyrna, he says, to the one who conquers will, uh, will not be hurt by the second death. Then in, a, a, again, a, a, later on there in, uh, um, in verse number 17 of chapter 2, to the church in Pergamum, he said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church, to the one who conquers. And then finally here to this church, to the one who who conquers? See, he's saying the same thing to all the churches. We must strive to conquer the various temptations that are common in every church. And by the way, common to all people. The church in Ephesus was tempted to abandon its first love. There are times when we are tempted to allow the things of this world to creep in and steal away our love for Jesus and to begin to move our hearts away from the things of God towards the things of this world. We're very tempted to do that. And so he says to the one who conquers, I'll give them a reward. There, there's a temptation among everyone when we're in the midst of persecution, like the church of Smyrna. Going through a tense time of persecution, there is a moment in everybody's life when we're tempted in the midst of persecution just to give up, just to throw in the towel. And he says to the one who conquers, to the one who stands up in the midst of that and keeps going forward, even though it's difficult, I'll give them a reward. There's a temptation to compromise like the church in Pergamum. They wanted to compromise. There's a, comp there's a temptation to tolerate evil like in the church of Thyatira. And every single time he says to the one who conquers, to the one who conquers, he's saying to us as a church, listen, don't give in. Don't give up. Don't lay down. Don't stop fighting. Keep moving forward no matter what. And he gives them a promise. He says to them, I'm going to allow them to rule the nations with me. Do you know that? One of these days, as believers, we're going to share in this incredible inheritance and rule the nations. And then at the very end of the book, listen to what he, or, 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 or of the letter, listen to what he says. He says, and I will give him the morning star. That morning star over in chapter 12 is Jesus. He's reminding them, keep on fighting. Because one of these days, the very presence of Jesus will come back to this earth. One of these days, you'll stand in his very presence. Keep on fighting. Don't tolerate evil stand firm for what is right here's the difficulty when we have to stand firm for what is right sometimes that'll make us unpopular amen it'll make us unpopular people look at you and think they're kind of crazy down there at first baptist they actually believe what the bible says yeah here, here let me let me say this if you're going to follow jesus you're not going to fit into this world you're going to stand out a little bit. You're going to be different from this world. But that's okay. It may feel like the whole world's against you and that you're getting overwhelmed. But I assure you, in the end, we will conquer. Amen? Stand with me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you for this day.
Thank you for this reminder that, Lord, even though we go through trying times, even though there's a great temper, temptation to compromise and tolerate evil and tolerate false teaching, Father, I pray that we would stand firm and stand true, that we would hold fast to the things that you've commanded us. Lord, for two reasons. Number one, because the gospel is so important that it's the only hope for mankind. Lord, we have the only message that can change people's eternal destinies. When we compromise that, Father, it's like signing death warrants. So, Father, help us to stay firm for the sake of reaching people with the gospel, but also, Lord, to know that in the end, there'll be a great reward. Help us to stay focused on you, Lord Jesus. Help us to stay true to the course you've given us. We love you and thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.